Greetings, beloved, and thank you for joining me here at May United Methodist Church as we gather for worship for June 11th, 2023. Let us call ourselves into this time and place of worship as we gather together. Come, let us worship Almighty God. Let us lift up our songs, our prayers, our praises. Come, let us honor Christ Jesus. Let us love Christ with our hearts, minds, and souls. Come, let us be filled with the spirit of the living God. Breathe in us breath of God. Alleluia. Beloved, let us pray together. O holy God, open unto me light for my darkness, courage for my fear, hope for my despair. O loving God, open unto me wisdom for my confusion, forgiveness for my sins, love for my hate. O God of peace, open unto me peace for my turmoil, joy for my sorrows, strength for my weakness. O generous God, open my heart to receive all of your good gifts. Amen. This week, I am going to share with you a little bit more of Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. So from Easter to Pentecost, we spent time really trying to pay attention to the, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, using those as key indicators. How can we tell when, when the Holy Spirit is at work? How can we tell when we're bearing fruit? How can we tell when someone is sharing the fruit of the Spirit with us? And, and so we spent that season really digging into that. Um, and then last week, we spent some time um, reading through uh, the first part of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, looking about at spiritual gifts um, and, and how those are a manifestation of the Spirit. And this idea that um, all the spiritual gifts we receive manifest themselves for the, for the common good, for the sumphira um, of the body, this, this sense of us bearing together on things and collaborating with one another and seeking to contribute as we help. Um, in this season of Pentecost, I want to offer one more um, idea of how the Holy Spirit functions in our world. And in this case, it's how the Spirit makes us one. It's, it's how the Spirit creates us into one body with many parts or many members. Um, and, and so Paul writes this beautiful analogy. I'm only going to share with you a small part of it. Um, but if you have the chance to read all of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 13, um, they're just, it's beautiful writing um, that Paul shares with this just um, immense vision of what it means to be a community of faith, what it means to be the body of Christ. Um, and for me, it, it's always trying to live into this idea. So I want to offer you these words from Paul's letter to the Corinthians, 12th chapter. I'm going to share with you verses 12 through 20. And so Paul writes to them, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in the one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Indeed, the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot would say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear would say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many members, yet one body. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As you hear the song of reflection today, I want to invite you to, to think about both your physical body. What is it that you appreciate about your physical body? What is it about the creation of your body that gives you a sense of wonder? Um, 
you know, and just take a real moment to think about how amazing it is that our bodies work the way they do. And, and then as you, as you start to recognize that about your physical body, um, I, I want you to expand that to think of our spiritual body. And I don't mean our individual ones, but the, the, the body of Christ, right? That this collection of those of us who know Jesus Christ as Savior, we, we are united in one baptism. We are united in the experience of the Holy Spirit, right? It is, it is this one thing that brings us all together. And as we know, uh, that's challenging. The, the one body, in my mind, rarely operates as one body. We often operate as though we are thinking. So Paul is trying to remind the Corinthians, you, know, you really need to appreciate that every person was designed specifically to contribute to the body in, in what is a beautifully important way, and that every member of the body really matters, and that if we were to lose one of them, um, the body would not be what it was meant to be. So would you ponder that while you hear the song of reflection? We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name to worship him. We have come into his house and gathered in his name Beloved, let us pray together. Glorious God, I offer all of myself up to you, my body, my heart, my mind, my spirit. May I serve you in this moment. May you be able to move my needs and my ego out of your way so that you can use me. May my words do no harm, but instead, may my words be used to share your word. May your message flow through me and out into the world. And may each person who chooses to listen hear you speaking to them, what you would have to say to them this day, and how they might use that word as they live disciples of Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. You may or may not know this about me, but I am not what is called a first career pastor. I am a second career pastor. This means that I had a career before I became a pastor. Now, I was not in that career for a terribly long time, only about seven years, um, but I was an athletic trainer. Um, and so if you're not sure what an athletic trainer does, um, it's not the same as a personal trainer, right? A personal trainer is a person that creates like a workout routine for you and helps you achieve health goals in that way. An athletic trainer is someone who specifically works alongside athletes. Um, for me, it was collegiate athletes. Um, and the easiest way I can explain it, if you've ever been watching a sporting event and an, and an athlete gets hurt and there's a person who runs out onto the field or the court um, to help that person, that is usually an athletic trainer. Um, in some of the higher up levels of sports, like the NFL, it's often actually an actual doctor. Um, but there's always an athletic trainer that's, that's involved in that. And an athletic trainer's job is to not only help keep all the athletes healthy, but when they are injured, to assess that injury, to decide if it's something that they can diagnose or if they need to have further testing done. And then once that diagnosis has come, the athletic trainer is responsible for trying to help heal that person and rehab their body and get them back to playing their position or their sport as quickly as possible while maintaining safety. And so um, and I loved it. I, I, I loved having that career. And so as a part of that, I have an undergraduate degree in athletic training, and then I actually have a, a master's in health and exercise science. Now, why do I share this with you? Because I'm about to geek out a little bit about the human body 
and how unbelievable it really is. Um, there have been few things that have convinced me and confirmed my belief in a divine creator as much as the complexity of the human body. It is far too complex and far too beyond our intellectual comprehension for it to have been something that accidentally came together. I just cannot get myself to believe that. Um, and, and it's not just human bodies, mammal bodies and avian bodies and reptile bodies. They're, they're all amazing and they are all slightly different to, to serve different functions and to survive um, in different climates. But the, the human body to me, it, it, it's so complex. And so as I went through undergrad and as I went through graduate school, I mean, I had to learn so much about the, the pieces of our body and how they function and, um, and the organs of our body and, and all of those things. And, and the more I learned, the more it was just amazing to me because our bodies are actually relatively small. And yet what they contain within them is rather mind-blowing. The other thing that I find that's a little bit interesting is that uh, we tend to take our bodies for granted. And when we pay attention to them is when some part of our body isn't functioning the way we want it to. When some part of our body is causing pain, um, when we don't have the same range of motion that we typically would have in a joint, um, when our, one of our organs isn't functioning correctly, that's when we really pay attention uh, to our bodies and it's usually in a really critical way. And so I just want you to take a moment today and marvel at the glorious gift that is each of our bodies. And, and we may not be the perfections of beauty that culture and society have created, um, but it, it's about how our body comes together and that how much our body contains. So let me share a few things with you. This one many of you have probably heard before, but um, so we have um, around 206 to 213 bones in our body. Some of them fuse together as we age, and so in some people, a couple of them don't fuse as much as others. So that's why there's that range. But most people, around 206 bones. I want you to think about that. Um, and, and the typical person can probably name about 10 of them. So to think about the number of bones that are in your hands and in your feet and that make up your skull and make up your spine, right? It's not just ribs and arms and leg bones, right? There's just this amazing, and that that is our stabilizing structure, that it is our bones that create a frame for everything else to connect to and be a part of. And how often do we really give thanks for the bones of our body, right? If you're anything like me, it's not until I've broken one of them <laughs> or bumped one of them really hard in, in that um, then I start to pay a little attention to them, right? But, but because we just, we move through our days just not even realizing how much purpose those 206 bones form and how they work together. Likewise, there are also around 600 muscles in our body. Now think about that for a second. How many can you name, right? 600 muscles. And again, the number of muscles in our face that allow us to smile, to frown, to look confused, to be hopeful, to be surprised, right? Like all of, those, all of that is this massive amount of musculature, again, in our hands. Right, the amount of, of individual little muscles that allow us to, to do the, the work of our hands is wondrous. The muscles that connect each piece of our spinal cord, each one of the vertebrae together to allow us to stand up straight, those muscles are contracting almost nonstop all day long. Think about that for a second. And, and so this is what is also fascinating. There are muscles such as our diaphragm um, and our back muscles uh, and, and many of our, in fact, most of our muscles, it's not even conscious thought for them to move. Every time you take a breath, your muscles are contracting. The muscles in, in your chest and in your diaphragm, and if you're taking a really deep breath, even the muscles up in your shoulder to draw that rib cage up and expand it to let your lungs expand as much as possible. And we do that without even thinking about it. 600 muscles. How many of you have experienced a little bit of joint pain? Maybe had a sprain at some point in your life? And that's when you notice one of the 900 ligaments that are in your body. 900 approximate ligaments that hold each and every joint together. I want you to think about the fact that in a lifetime, 
we may only experience one or two of them that fail. I don't know about any of you, but if there was a success rate of 898 out of 900 times, we would consider that to be pretty darn good. That would be a pretty high safety rating. Um, a few people, depending on the sports they play and the activities they do, they might have a few more. And often it's the same ligament that gets sprained more than once. Right? But to think about that, 895 out of 900 for our ligaments, you will never even be aware of because they will just do what they are there to do. Again, to give range of motion and stability as we move. If we didn't have ligaments, every time we went to move our fingers, all those bones would scatter all over the place. And I can't even, that, that does not sound good. That sounds like the beginning of a horror movie. So 206 bones, 600 muscles, 900 ligaments. That's the basic structure of our body. Then there is actually how our body keeps us alive. The organs in our body, the blood vessels, and the nerves. And this is probably going to blow your mind. So I want you to think about moments where we have intestinal distress. This is something that I think everybody experiences throughout life. I don't know anybody that hasn't. Um, and it comes in a variety of ways, none of which I'm going to describe to you in detail because I think you can picture it. And, and I don't know about you, but right, that seems like a pretty small part of our body. Did you know that there are 30 feet, 30 feet of intestine? For someone my height who is five foot, that is six times the length of my body packed into that small part of my abdomen to help process food and nutrients for me every day. If you're closer to six feet tall, then it's five times the length of your body. Think about that for a second. 30 feet of intestine. That's what it takes to process food in our bodies. And again, unless we're experiencing some type of distress, it's just something that happens in our body. But what, what if we didn't have that 30 feet of intestine, right? We, we, we need it. In a single day, the average heart will pump nearly 2,000 gallons of blood throughout a 24-hour time period. So every day, our heart is pumping through. There's only four to six liters of blood in our entire body, but it circulates so much through the day that around 2,000 gallons is pumped in and out of our heart. Just to put that in perspective for you, that would fill most swimming pools. So our hearts process as much water, as much blood in a day as a swimming pool, swimming pool filter does. I mean, think about that for a second. That's, and does it every day of our lives for decades. How amazing is that? You know, and the circulation of our blood doesn't just carry nutrients and, and oxygen, which is, of course, essential, but the circulation of our blood is also what helps regulate us from being hot and cold. Um, it, it protects us. I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to think about. To build on top of that, it has to go through this channel of blood vessels. And so I looked this up. Now, I use the most reliable of, of, of resources, of course. I use Google. Um, and so I'm sure there's no possible way this could be wrong. Um, but... Uh, so I, I wanted to know how many miles of blood vessels do we have in our bodies? Because I know how tiny some of them are um, and how many there are. And so if you lay them out end to end, all the way down in a long line, um, according to Google, there would be approximately 60,000 miles of blood vessel from a single person's body. Now, to put that in perspective, you could go around the world twice with that distance. You could travel the circumference of the world twice. How is that possible? How is it possible that that's all contained in these little shells of bodies? And to think about how much that means, how many blood vessels there are in our brains and throughout our bodies and, and the essential roles to living that they play. And we never give any thought to it until we have a cut and we're bleeding from one of those blood vessels. So we're losing something, but otherwise they just function. Um, and, and, and lastly, I want to share with you nerves, which carry those electrical impulses, which allows our heart to beat, which is what creates thoughts for us, um, is what allows for muscles to contract and relax. Um, over 7 trillion nerves in our body. 7 trillion nerves. Now, no question, a huge number of those are contained um, in our brains and in our spinal column, but just to think about that, 
the wonder of that. So let me just review that list for you again. As we think about our physical bodies and, and all that makes up so that we can just live a day, not do anything dramatic, not play a sport or anything else, but just get up, move through our day, breathe, and function. 206 bones, 600 muscles, 900 ligaments, 30 feet of intestine, 2,000 gallons of blood pumped through our heart each day, through 60,000 miles of blood vessels, all controlled and directed by over 7 trillion nerves. When you take all that into account, it's actually kind of impressive how little we pay attention. But I feel like it's really a disservice to our bodies that we only notice a part of it when it isn't functioning right, when our hearing is failing us, when our vision is failing us, when we suffer an extreme injury and we lose a part of our body. And we live in a blessed world in a time where there are many ways to overcome a lost body part. It, is, it does not have to be life-ending to lose even a limb. It is certainly life-changing. But, but not life-ending. I myself wear co co corrective lenses. I imagine, based on my family history, there will come a time in my life, if I live long enough, where I will need hearing aids of some kind. Um, right? I think of um, the assistive equipment that we have in our world so that when some part of our body is not functioning correctly, we can overcome that. And why do I share all that with you? You're like, ah, that's been a pretty long lecture about the human body. Yes, it has. That's because I want you to fully appreciate what it is that Paul is writing to the people of Corinth. Now, Paul would not have had these kinds of facts, right? What, what we understand of the body now, which is still just the tip of the body iceberg, there's still so many things that we don't understand, but we know so much more over the last 2,000 years than even Paul knew. So, so Paul was taking it more from a surface experience, right? But, but Paul is wanting people to understand, as each part of your body is essential and has its own purpose. You know, what would it, we do not need our fingers to function like our eyes, right? And we do not need our heart to function like our intestines. And we do not need our foot to function like our ears. We need each of them to do what they were designed to do. I want you to imagine if your fingers were also trying to be your eyes and your ears and how disorienting that might be. You'd have 10 more eyes and 10 more ears. I can't even imagine how we would, how we would handle that. What if your foot tried to be your mouth? Now, I know some of us have put our feet in our mouths. We've all experienced that, I'm sure. But what if you were trying to talk through your feet instead of through your mouth? Right? We, that's ludicrous. Who tries to have a conversation with their feet? That's because we recognize that each part of its body has been designed to do a specific purpose, and we appreciate that purpose. And Paul is saying to the Corinthians, who are having a really hard time coming together as one body, um, they, they want to know from Paul, which of us is the most important? You know, how should we, so you've, you know, Paul has said to them, there's all these different spiritual gifts. And so some people will prophesy and some people will preach and some people will be good at music and some people will know wisdom um, and some people will know healing and some people have the gift of prayer and some people have the gift of miracles, right? The list can go on and on. The speaking of tongues, the translation of the speaking of tongues, right? The, the list is numerous, right? And, and he said, there's, there's all these gifts. And so they're like, that's wonderful. And, and he said to them, and each of you will get those gifts as ever, however God has designed you for your purpose to the common good, to the sumphira, right, to the, to the body of Christ, that, that, that whatever your gifts are, uh, are, are how you're supposed to contribute. Everybody's like, okay, that sounds great. And they're like, now, Paul, tell us, which gift is the most important? And Paul's like, N no, it isn't. Could you make an argument that one part of our body is more essential to living than others? Sure, because as we've argued, if I lost both my arms, I could survive. And through a lot of work and a lot of strength of will and faith and adaptive equipment, I could lead a full life without my arms. It would not be the same as having arms, but it could be done, and we know that because people do it all the time. If I were to lose my heart or my brain, I would seek to function. So can you make an argument? that one part is perhaps more essential to living than another, perhaps. But what Paul wants them to see isn't that one is more important or essential than the other, 
but instead to recognize that every single piece of your body comes together to produce motion and action and the ways of living. And that also is the body of Christ. It doesn't matter who's the brain or who's the heart or who's the feet or who's the hands or who are the eyes or who are the ears or who are the intestines or who are the blood vessels. It isn't about which of you is what. It's about understanding that every part is important and valuable. And though you can live without some of them, there is something lost when they are not a part of the body of Christ. And so Paul wants us to recognize the absolute essential contribution of every single person. It is so easy, my friends. To look at the body of Christ, which sometimes we just look at within within our congregation. I mean, the body of Christ is a worldwide collection of people. But, but just within our congregation, it's so easy to look at it and to think the pastor is the most important. Do I play an important role? Of course I do. But I want to ask you, if you really think I am somehow more valuable than the person that cleans the building. How much would you want to be here if the building was filthy and was crawling with rodents and insects and dirt? How good would my preaching really need to be for you to sit in filth every week to hear it? I want you to think about the music that staff members produce for us, and it's wondrous. It, it contributes to worship in such a beautiful way. So it might be most important to think that the music director is, is the most essential. How much would the music matter if we never visited people in hospitals? If the members of our church who visit our shut-ins and bring them to church because they can no longer drive themselves, how much would the music matter in their lives without the disciples who keep them connected to the body of Christ? the ligaments, the ligaments that do visits, the ligaments that send cards, that make sure that one bone does not move away from the other. And they get stretched and they get pulled and they get tired over the decades. But they are essential. You probably don't want to sit through another hour or so as I compare every part of the body to every type of person. But I hope you hear what I'm saying. Too often in the body of Christ, it is only when we think of someone as not functioning properly, they're not doing what we want them to do, or they're not doing it the way we want them to do it, they're causing some turmoil perhaps, that's when we notice them. That's when we pay attention, just like we do with our bodies. And, and instead on this day, in this week, just as I asked you to give thanks to God for the gift of your physical body, and I understand some of your physical bodies are not what you want them to be. Some of you are in constant pain, and, and I hear that. I'm not diminishing that. But even in the pain, our bodies are still miracles. And I think that's true of the body of Christ right now. In our own church tradition, we are going through some splitting. We're going through some amputations, if you will. And it is painful. And it should be. It isn't that we won't find a way to live or that there can't be healing. It, it may be that at some point in time we figure out how to reattach the pieces that we are losing. But what I want us to do is to look around at our body of Christ and give thanks to God for each and every person who is a part of it. Even if we don't know what it is they bring to the body. Do you understand the function and the purpose of every single part of your physical body? Of course you don't. In fact, no one on earth does. Even the experts that, that know more than anybody else still would tell you we don't know it all. We don't know it all because we still don't know how to do certain things. We don't know how to study certain things, right? And so, so just think about that. Even the experts don't understand the purpose and the role of every part of our bodies. As much as we know, we still don't know it all. Well, that is true of our bodies of Christ as well. We may not know the purpose or function or role of every single member in the body of Christ. We, we, we may not, they, they may be as confusing to us as our gallbladder, right, or, um, or our pancreas. You know, it isn't until we develop diabetes 
that all of a sudden we care a lot about our pancreas. And so before we get to that place, in moments of health, in moments of joy, in moments of worship, I want us to just pause and give thanks to God. Thank you for each and every person. And, and I want us in response to this gratitude to work just a little harder, each and every one of us, to extend that gratitude to one another, to find a way to say to somebody around us, I am grateful that you are here. I may not even know what you do, but I'm going to assume that you are important to the body of Christ. I'm going to, I'm going to move from that assumption. Rather than asking you to prove to me how you are important, which so often can only be identified when it's lost, broken, or injured. Instead of asking you to prove to me why I should consider you to be important, I want us to assume that every person in the body of Christ is valuable and important. And I want us to work on loving one another and treating each other this way. It will not be a, a journey of perfection. But I, I think about what it could be. And, and so I'm, I'm going to ask you, I want you to speak to one person in the body of Christ this week. I don't, it could be a member of our congregation. It could be just somebody you know who believes in Jesus, and so therefore they are also a part of the body of Christ. It may be somebody you know well. It may be somebody you barely know at all. You might send them. It might be somebody you've never met. Maybe you want to send somebody a, an email that is a part of the body of Christ, somebody that writes a devotional or does a podcast or you know, somebody like that, that that contributes to your experience of God. And I just want you to find one of those members of the body of Christ and say, thank you. Thank you for being a part of, body, of the body of Christ. Thank you for doing what you do. Because the body of Christ would not be the same without you. You are valuable. And I recognize and appreciate what you do in the body of Christ. One person. And the next week I want you to find one more person. But, and I want you to just start looking around us what it is that people are doing. And, and especially I find myself always even more grateful for the people that do the things that I don't want to do. I don't want to clean the church building. I shudder to think what would ever happen if I was ever in charge alone of keeping the building clean. I, I don't know what that would look like, but it would not look how it looks right now. There are tasks in the office that I really don't enjoy, and I am so grateful, like putting together the newsletter. I don't mind writing the content of the newsletter, but the whole spreading it out and finding the images and, and the layout of it and the formatting of it, I don't want anything to do. And so I'm so grateful for Gwen, our office administrator, because not only is she good at that and does a beautiful job, she does it with joy. It's something she enjoys because God has made her different than me. And that is not a bad thing. That is a wondrous, miraculous thing. We should be grateful that people do things differently than we do. We should be grateful for all the different perspectives and all the different approaches and all the different ways. Beloved, there are many members, more than we can actually count. But we are one body. And you are essential to it. You are a beautiful and wondrous part. Do not diminish who you are by saying, I'm only a pinky finger. I'm only a toe. I'm only a small bone in the spine. Because I promise you, if we lost you, we would notice. You are essential. Know that within yourself and offer it to someone around you. May God be with you, keep you, and bless you till we meet again.